Amen, amen. So uh, we're in this series right now called Because I Said So. And what we've been doing is every single week we've been looking at a dysfunctional phrase in our culture that we use in different relationships. And when we use that dysfunctional phrase, like because I said so to our kids, we kind of pour dysfunction into those relationships, don't we? So today's phrase is, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And that's that whole idea of, in a marriage, it kind of ought to be 50-50. Anybody ever tell you it was 50-50? And anybody out there find out that it's not 50-50? It just doesn't work. Because this idea of, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, the idea is, you give me all the things that I want in the marriage, and if you do, then I'll give you all the things that you want. And then the flip is also true. If you don't give me what I want or what I think I need, then I will withhold from you. And what we've introduced into marriage is the concept of law and earning instead of grace. We talk about the concept of grace in God's word a lot here. And grace is going to be at the center of this message today. But before I go any further, let me give you this disclaimer about today. We're talking about marriages, but some of you guys are like, oh boy, this is the day I came to church. They're talking about marriages. I can tune out. (laughs) Don't tune out. Some of you will be married someday. You desperately need this message. Some of you are married right now, and this is exactly what you need. Listen in. Lean forward. Some of you are outside of a marriage, and you're not sure if you're ever going to get married again. Could I just encourage you that you don't know the plans that God has for you? But number two, God may also call you to be a counselor or a spiritual parent to somebody else who needs this exact truth. So let his wisdom come into you. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says that all scripture is God breathed. And it's not just true, it's profitable for us. Amen? Amen. That means it's useful. Like we need every single verse, whether it's written to singles or married or divorcees, whoever it is, it's for us. Say it's for us. It's for us. us. Okay, so here's here's the basic idea. Did you ever go on a merry-go-round? you ever go on a merry-go-round as a kid? We actually have a picture of it up here for you. And the reason is, is because during first service, some people let me know that I was way too old and that some of our younger folks don't even know what a merry-go-round is. So here's the relic right here on your screens. It's an antique, if you will. Like I spent so much time in the local parks on a merry-go-round. And so here's the first concept. Number one, there's no electricity involved. Shocking, I know right? And what you do is literally with your own powers, like a five-year-old kid, you come and you grab one of those things and you start to spin it. And then you start to run. And you spin it as hard as you can and you run as fast as you can. And then you jump on the thing and you get what? 30 seconds of entertainment? And then then you do it all over again. And if it's a really good day, there's another kid at the playground with you and they'll probably push it way too fast and then you'll fall and scrape your knee and it's the best day ever. That's the merry-go-round, right? Like, like, you spin it, I spin it, we have a great time. That's the concept. In our marriages, it's kind of the exact same way. He spins it. She spins it. And we have a great time. I love you. You love me. We keep loving each other. And every single act of love that we give to each other causes the love merry-go-round to spin. Anybody want to be in the spin zone? Anybody used to be in the spin zone and would like to get back? I think a lot of us would like to get back. Uh, When we're dating and before we're married and we're in love, do you remember how the spin zone was back when you were in love? (laughs) Some of you shook your head way too quick and then she jabbed you like that, right? Don't do that. Um, when you're in love, it's this, it's this really special place where it feels like it's not even work to get the thing spinning, right? It feels like you're doing everything for her and she's doing everything for you and you're not even thinking about it, but you are thinking about it because every time you're going to be around her, you pick out your clothes in a special way, right? 
Like you were already in certain clothes, but you're going to be around her, so you change your clothes for her. You used to do that. Like you're going to make sure that your hair looks right. You're going to make sure that you're calling. You're going to make sure that you're doing all these things because you know they love those things. And you're idiots, by the way. <laughs> and you'll get on the phone and you'll talk till 3 in the morning, won't you? And it's like, and it's so late, and you've run out of things to talk about. You've processed everything that can be processed. And you're like, let's just sit here and breathe on the phone. Let's just breathe. Because you so want to be with each other. It's like God, just in the way that he set this up for us as humans, it's like he poured all this gooey glue all over us as young people, and it's like we just stick together. We, it doesn't even feel like we work at it. But we do work at it. When Linda and I were dating, and it was time for me to pop the question, I had a whole plan. When we do premarital counseling, one of the first things that we do is we always ask them to tell us their proposal story because there's always good comedy involved. So um, this, this day came, and, and I got to preface it. There were no cell phones at this time. That's how old I am. No cell phones at all. And I planned this thing. We were going to go to the park. It's called McNaughton Park in Pekin, Illinois. And there's a picture of it. It had this beautiful, gorgeous oak tree, like right in the center of this hill. And it was so picturesque and all this kind of thing. And so I told her, I'm like, and it was Father's Day. I'm like, I want us to go on this big hike at McNaughton Park on Father's Day. And I tried to call her dad right before we left because I wanted to ask him for, uh, for her hand in marriage. And I was being super traditional about it. And I couldn't get through because it was Father's Day. I should have planned that better and like called him a week ahead. And I didn't. And I didn't think about it. But it's like the phone was busy. And, and again, just like merry-go-rounds for you young people, back in the old days, if it was busy, that was it. <laughs> like, like, you couldn't like also text dad. You couldn't, you couldn't also do anything. He was, it, he was busy. You were done. And so... I had told her when we were going to take our hike, so we go out to the park, we take the hike, we hike all around, and I can't pop the question. And so we go back home where the phones are, and I call him again, and this time I get through, and I walk in, and he, actually, he says, yes, yes, you can have her hand in marriage. So I then go up to Linda, and I'm like, can we take another hike? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I thought I was so smooth. So we go out there, and this time it's late in the day. And so we're out there at that big oak tree, and I, I carve my initials and her initials into the tree. There's a picture of the initials, right? And it's like, and I've got this like, like pocket knife, and it takes me like two hours to like, to like etch our initials. And like in Hollywood, they make it seem really easy. They must have some tree with some really thin bark. This was an oak tree, super old, super thick bark. Um, I did a really terrible job. Lie to me later and say you can actually see the initials, okay? Do that. But it's like, this, this was taken 20 years later. It's permanent. So we were in love. That's what you do. So by the time I got ready to pop the question, it was way too late in the day. I'd waited way too long, and it's dark outside. And when I go down on one knee, she can't even see me. She has no <laughs> idea what's going on. And, and for some reason, there was literally a swarm of mosquitoes right around us. <laughs> And she's getting bit, and she's like, what's going on? And I finally say, will you marry me? And she finally realizes what's going on. And she put her hand down and, like, feels the ring that's in my, my hand. And, like, <laughs> and then immediately says, okay, yes, can we go to the car right now? <laughs> and so we do, and we bolt for the car. And we jump in the car. We turn on the dome light in the car. We just sit there, and it's cooler in the car. Air conditioning is going. And we're just like, we're drinking in how wonderful of a moment this is. We just made this massive decision, and we love each other, and our whole lives are ahead of us. Have you ever been in that crazy place? And it's wonderful. And you are seriously in the spin zone, are you not? Doing all kinds of stuff for each other. That's just how we are there. But let's, let's peel back a few things for just a sec. Even though it feels like everything is going easy, and even though it feels like everything that you're doing for each other is motivated just by, I'm just crazy about this person. And that's true. There's also another subtle underlying thing that's also going on, isn't there? You're in a job interview, aren't you? When you're dating, you're evaluating each other. When you're dating, 
You're motivated to do certain things for each other, to, to, to spin that merry-go-round just a little bit more because you know you're being evaluated and you don't want that other person to leave and you want them to give you the job, amen? It's what you want. And so there's a lot of things that you do and if we're, if we're really... If we're really thinking about it, what, what's, what's motivating a lot of that is fear. Fear that they'll leave. And that's important to understand. I'm not trying to bash it. The reason I, I, I try to uncover that is because even though it's fear that's motivating us in those early days, some of what we're doing, it's motivating some of what we're doing in the early days. What we're hopeful about is that when we say the I do's and we become married for real and we make our covenant, what we're hoping is there will be no more fear. We're hoping that once we have the job, we've got it. And once we have the job, we won't have to impress each other anymore. We'll be able to be the real us, let our hair down, and they can never leave us again. <laughs> right? And so those are some of the expectations that we come in, and, and some of it's just, it's, it's not super mature and like we have these expectations like we're going to get married and it's going to be so wonderful and think about what's underneath that it's going to be so wonderful they're going to meet all my needs all my friends all my family they didn't meet my needs but this person they're perfect and they're going to meet my needs right we put that on them or they're going to know me my deepest darkest darkest secrets they're going to see the real me. And when they see the real me and they see my secrets, they're still going to accept me and love me in spite of that. It's one of the deepest needs that we have as human beings. Did you know that? That we would be known. We want to be known for who we really are. And we want that person who knows us for who we really are to look at us and to love us anyway. And that is a picture of deep peace for a human being. And we put that on our spouse, don't we? And we're going to talk to 3 a.m. for the rest of our lives, just like this. And we're going to be naked every single day. Right? <laughs> Are we going to be real today? There's things that we put on each other. So then we get married, and then and, and the wheels spin. And for the first year or two, it's like it keeps spinning like that, and things are still good. But then we do start sleeping in, and we do start hanging around in our sweats all day long. Come on. We don't do our hair, maybe. We let our temper fly a little bit more than we used to back when we were dating. We start to let the real us out. And the more we do, the harder it is to spin that wheel, Right? And then you stop to spin it a little bit. And then she stops to spin it a little bit. And then the whole thing kind of slows down. And eventually, sometimes it stops. And the very first time in your relationship when it stopped, you were shocked. And you didn't know what to do. Now, what's a spin? So let's talk love languages. Anybody know about the love languages, the five love languages? We preached on it before. Gary Chapman wrote this wonderful book. His, his perspective, and I think it's really helpful for us, is that there are five different ways we spin that wheel. Five different languages of love that we speak to each other. And depending on who you are, you might speak a different language to somebody else and you might receive a different language better from somebody else. So we've got five of them. Words of affirmation are the first one. Like, just tell me how great I am, please. Like, that makes my day. Maybe it's physical touch. Maybe it's the giving and receiving of gifts. At 2 p.m. today, you were in a gift shop and you thought of me and you picked this thing out for me. You gift givers in the room, that's what you love. Quality time. Quality time does not just mean any time while we're doing five other things. It means we sit down eye to eye and we talk to each other. Quality time. And then acts of service. Wash the dishes, please. Amen. Amen. So when we say you're spinning that cycle, that spin zone, that merry-go-round, you're doing the five love languages for each other. And when you speak the words to each other, like the person who wants words of affirmation, right? Like you could say, hey, you look great in those jeans. But if that's not her specific love language that she's after, that'll have some points for you, but it won't have maximum points. Where are my gamers at today? Right? You're all about the maximum points, right? But like, 
If words of affirmation is his thing and she comes along and says, I'm so glad I married you. You got that promotion. You must be great at your job. You must be the best husband ever. Thank you for taking care of our family. You make that speech to him. Oh, my gosh. Right? Like he's on cloud nine for a week. Ten times points. And all points reset at midnight. Amen? Because <laughs> it is how it works. So take out your program really quick. There's, some, there's like a notes section on the back. And take out the pen that's in front of you, the seat back in front of you. And maybe just write there freehand, what do you think is your top love language? And what do you think is your spouse's? This is a quiz. Don't get it wrong. I'm just kidding. It's valuable to talk about over lunch today. Have that conversation. Because so much is going to be how do we get back in that spin zone with each other. And knowing what each other's top love language is is going to help you do that. Okay, you're writing there. Go back to expectations. We came in with all these expectations, right? Like they were going to know me and they were going to be present and they were never going to leave me and we were going to be naked all day and all that kind of stuff. What happens if that all doesn't come true in the first few years of your marriage? Disappointment sets in. Even despair. And I'm not saying we all go straight to despair. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes it takes us a really long time to really let that disappointment set in. But you know what that does to the spin zone, right? Like it really does make you want to not do as much for them as you would have if you felt fulfilled by them. And sometimes it does come to a stop. And what in the world do we do when everything comes to a stop? I call it the crazy go round. Some of us are right there, aren't we? And some of us, like we've had times in the past, you could say this maybe, like we've had times in the past where it stopped and then we restarted it. We resurrected it. We gave it another spin. You've had moments where you let it stall out for six months. You've had moments, maybe you're in it right now. It's been six years. And what you're doing is you're living with none of the fun, none of the excitement, none of the fire that you used to have, and you've become partners, roommates, business partners, and we've got customers called kids, and we've got a budget, and we've got things to do, and we've just got to kind of get through it, but this thing that we used to have, this fire that we used to have that made all of this worth doing, we've kind of abandoned it, and we've, we've grown accustomed to it, and if we're real about it, we're broken hearted down deep on the inside that we've let it go. It's time to start it back up again. We're going to talk about how to do that because this verse, this next verse I'm going to give you shows you the Bible's vision for your marriage. This is Proverbs 5, 18 through 19. It says, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving dear. This is, this is poetry, right? P picturesque language, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always and may you always be captivated by her love. The first thing I want you to notice there is it says this is all about you getting back to the wife of your youth. So guess who this is being written to? An old man. And it's the old cliche of the old wealthy man who might be tired of his wife and he starts looking around, midlife crisis, anyone? And the Bible's coming into that picture and saying, no, no, no. You've got to find the being captivated place all over again. And that should last all the way. How many of you have seen the movie Up with Carl and Ellie in the first 10 minutes? Is it the most gorgeous thing ever? And what do we all take away from that we think is so sweet and wonderful is the fact that they are so tender toward each other and just on fire for each other, even into the like, what is it, their 70s, their 80s? I mean, I don't know what. And it's also the most heartbreaking scene ever in a movie, ever. But it's like, but don't we love that picture? That was not Pixar's idea. That was in your Bible long ago. Right? Sometimes we come to church and it's like, 
We're so committed to each other in our marriage. We hate each other's guts, but we're so committed. And we'll never divorce. That's not the, that's not the goal. Have a better goal. Proverbs has a goal for you. Be drunk in love, Beyonce, all the way into your 70s. That's what it says there. The actual word for captivated is shaga. It's intoxicated. Be intoxicated with their love. Okay, so there's things that poison the relationship. So let's talk about foxes for a second. Um, this verse, this is Song of Songs 215. We're going to jump right into this one. And... Um, this is a poem. Song of Songs is an Old Testament poem between a husband and wife as they're getting married. And it's a beautiful picture. But look at this. It says, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that run the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. Now, that might seem really, really vague to you. But if you read the context of that passage, the whole book, every time they talk about a vineyard, what they're describing is their relationship, their love. And they call it a vineyard because if we tend it right and if we water it right, we do all the right things, then beautiful fruit will come out of it. And so they say, but sometimes it's these outside forces that kind of come in to our garden, into our vineyard, and it kind of ruins things. So let's talk about what the foxes are really quickly. I want you to see this. I'm not going to go super deep into these things, but if you are taking notes, you might want to write down some of the foxes that might be going on creating damage in your relationship right now. Here they are. Number one, money issues. You ever struggle with money issues? Does that ever create a fight in your environment? And does that ever make you distant from each other? And it's really hard to show love because it's the money issue that's gotten in there. How about chores? You're like, chores, that's so silly. <laughs> right? I always take out the trash. Never in your house, just mine, right? <laughs> right? Like all those things, it's like we should have really planned out. We should have figured out at this point and we don't have it figured out and all these little bitternesses come in. Do you see what it's trying to describe? It's these outside foxes that are coming in, sexual frustration. How about exhaustion, physical, emotional? How about in-laws? Just say this real quick. It's not the in-laws' fault. We talked about this last week. It's not the in-laws' fault. It's a loyalty question. Sometimes the in-laws get your spouse's loyalty over yours. The Bible's really clear. We need to leave father and mother and cleave to our spouse. That's the way it's supposed to work. Loyalty should be to your spouse first. And if you can get the loyalty figured out, it helps. Hurts in arguments. Sometimes it's the way that we fight. Sometimes we fight cruel. And some of you just need to go out today and you need to get a book on how to fight fair. There are a lot of really great books on there on strategies of like how to make some rules for each other so that you don't go too far in some of the things that you say. Because sometimes the thing that brought on the fight is super tiny, but what you did in the fight lasts years. Foxes. Unforgiveness emotional distance, health problems. Health problems can go on a long time, right? Take all your energy away from you. You don't have anything else to give. And then, of course, you got big issues like abuse and unfaithfulness and bitterness. And I'm really not going after the big issues in today's message. I really want to keep it focused on how do we just keep the merry-go-round going in our marriage? But write some of those things down if they apply to you. What's ruining your relationship right now? Next passage. How do we keep the love spinning? Powerful passage, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Some of you guys, as soon as I put this up on the screen, you're like, oh boy, here we go. Why? Because when we're about to read through this, this is going to feel almost impossible to do. I'll just warn you up front. Here, one of the most life-changing things that happened for me in my own reading and understanding of the New Testament is the day that somebody showed me the passage in 1 John, the book of 1 John where it says, God is love. Watch me here. God is love. God does not, it's not that God loves, God is love. Like it's his essence, it's his character, it's his nature, it's just what he does. 
And then you jump over here to 1 Corinthians 13, and the Apostle Paul tells you that thing called love that God is, let me describe practically exactly how it works. And then you start reading through this, and of course it's going to intimidate you because it's God-level love. You can't do this, but you can try. So let's see what trying looks like. Number one, love is patient. Now, this love definition, it applies to every single human relationship you can imagine, right? So this is how parents should love their children. It's how children should love their parents. It's how friends should love each other. And definitely how spouses should love each other inside of a marriage. So let's take it on the merry-go-round for a second. So what does it mean that love makes us be patient? It means when I'm tempted to say, I've been waiting forever for you to change, and you just haven't. I'm done. No. Love is patient. Love gives them time and space to grow and to change, and they need time and space. And guess what? You need time and space too. And don't you love the people that God's given you in your life that give you the time and space, and they never give up on you? Love is patient. Next, love is kind. you got to be kind. You got to be kind when you don't feel it. And that's the most important time to be kind. It's almost like saying fake it till you make it. And I hate that phrase, but it's a little bit that way. To be kind on the merry-go-round means they haven't done anything for me. Yeah, but do it anyway. Right? Be the strong one today. Step up and say, I'm pushing this thing. Let's go. I'm going to do the five top things I know they love so much, even though I feel like I'm coming from zero. And some of you have been doing that. God bless you. But to be kind even when you don't feel it, to go out on that date even when you feel like there's no emotion between you, and to go through the motions until the emotions catch up. Next, be humble. Stop telling yourself that you're a better spouse than they are. This is big for a lot of us, right? Be humble. You make these speeches in your head, and they're always the villain, right? Be humble. Be yielding. Yield to what they need and want. Love is not self-seeking. It's one of the most amazing lines about God in the world is this idea that the God of the universe is not self-seeking. Did you know that? He does not seek his own. He seeks the good. That's the way that God does it. We're elevating Jesus right now in this passage. We're raising up the character of Jesus Christ, and we're worshiping him right now in this passage because if you could get a clear vision of who Jesus actually is, the more you study it, the more you focus on it, that's why we sing the songs, the more it will change your view of every other relationship that you have because you're trying to do it like Jesus. He's not self-seeking. So yield to what they need and want. Next, don't keep score. Love keeps no record of wrongs. No lists, no records. Back in 1995, you did this. Nope. You always do this. You never do that. Those words shouldn't be there because we're not keeping records with each other. I know that sounds like a tall order. And then this last one, do not lose hope ever. But he doesn't deserve my hope. I know. Always trusts, always perseveres, always hopes. Do you see the essence of love there? What a fierce fire it could be in the middle of a human relationship. But this is God. And so we look at that whole thing. And if you're honest with yourself, you look at that whole thing and you're like, how in the world can I do that in my marriage? Because that sounds exhausting. Sounds impossible. And you're right. It is impossible. Let's pray. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're all so dutiful. It's so good. No, it's impossible. But we still try. It's impossible. This mountain that we're supposed to climb, but we still climb. And isn't it good to know where we're going? There's a spot in 1 Peter where, where God says to us, he says, be holy because I am holy. Yeah, right, God. 
Do you even know me? Be, like, I know there's a mystery that through the imparted righteousness of Jesus Christ, I'm seen through that lens by the Father, and I am righteous in his eyes. Praise God for that. But my earthly behavior, be holy for I am holy. But shouldn't I at least try? Shouldn't I see God? Shouldn't I worship him? Shouldn't I, shouldn't I be inspired by him and say, this is the way I want to march? And guess what? Our crazy go round over here has stalled for years. And I need a little bit more of God the Father's sanity to come into our insanity. Even if it's a little speck at a time. And so reach and so do that and take that passage and like bookmark that thing and text it to your spouse and print it and put it on your bathroom mirror in the morning and just say, this is what I do when the merry-go-round stops. God gave me very specific instructions. Amen? Linda and I have been married for 25 years. We'll be 26 years this November. Yep. Now, some of you applaud because you're like, that's an accomplishment. You have no idea what she's put up with. You need to applaud again for her and all that she's put up with. Because, yeah, I'm a bit much. <laughs> so we've been doing a lot of talking about this, this whole message today. And how it can change and like what we've learned in our marriage after these years and, and kind of where we're at today. And if I could just tell you kind of where we're at today, here's just a really practical way to describe it. We're kind of in a spot where um, we've learned this whole merry-go-round thing about ourselves. And we understand the love languages. And we've seen the merry-go-round stop and start countless times. And it used to stop. And we'd let it go on way too long. We, we didn't know how to get things going again. And here's one of the biggest things that I feel like we've learned as of today. Catch me in five years, there might, might be more. But the first thing I feel like we've learned today is that whichever one of us is the very first one to notice, we've got to run to each other. Amen. We've got to run to each other. We've got to have the conversation. Like this is exactly what we're dealing with right now. You've stopped showing love toward me, and I've stopped showing love toward you. Can we just have the sit-down summit with each other, look ourselves in the eyes, and say, you know what? We're not going to let this go on any longer. We're going to cancel some appointments, and we're going to fix this. And we're going to do it together. Just having that conversation, guess what? The peaks and the valleys, it shortens the valleys. You can do that. It shortens the valleys. It shortens the valleys for us. Here's another thing that you've got to do is you have to forgive and that's surprising in that whole merry-go-round illustration. It's like, it feels like you've just got to love each other more, and that's true. But when the engine is cold and dead, and you're like, am I going to be the one to start it again? Because, again, you don't know Linda Trueblood. She does this 10 times more than I do. She's the first to see. She's so wise. And she's so humble to be able to come to me and get my attention on this. I mean, I can't, I can't speak about her enough. She's, she's given me so much. But to, to try to be that person, you have to forgive. And it's not the big list of sins that we often think of with forgiveness. What you're forgiving them for is all the things that they should have done, to you up to, done for you up to this point. Right? Because it's, it's hard. Why should I do this for him when he hasn't done all these things? And you've got to forgive those things. The little forgiveness you've got to do. And then when you decide to be the strong one that day, you can't do it for them. This is weird. This is the weirdest part of this message. You can't do it for them. You've got to do it for us. It's a slight tweak. It took us a long time to get to this. But you've got to do it for us. Why? Because if you do it for them, what you've got built in there is this expectation, again, that they're going to bring it back around to you. And then they don't because they're a blockhead, right? <laughs> and then you're disappointed and you're discouraged. And you're like, no, no, you got to do it for us because you believe in us. And us is something that's worth building. And it's something that's worth fighting for. And you've got to do it for the us that we can be. 
and the us that God has called us to be, and the us that we want to be for our kids, and the us that we want to be for each other, and the us that we want to be for our grandkids. And it goes on and on and on. Because I don't want to live without the fire anymore. That's what we've learned. Last thing I got to tell you about Hosea. Hosea, prophet Hosea. If you've been asleep this whole time, it's time to wake up. This is the part you really need because this will blow your mind. God took me to this passage this, this week. The book of Hosea in the Old Testament, he's an Old Testament prophet. He's a young man and God comes to him and says, marry this woman named Gomer. And you can read about it in Hosea chapter one through three. But God comes to him and says, marry this woman, Gomer. And it's important because Gomer had a little bit of a reputation. But God said specifically, marry her. And so Hosea does. And I mean, I don't know what's in the young man's mind. Maybe he's like, I'm this big prophet of God. She'll be so impressed. And They have three kids. And they're of this wonderful family. They have a boy and then a girl and then they have another boy. And it's like I imagine them driving around the minivan in ancient Israel and just having a great time, right? Perfect. Perfect little family. And then something goes wrong. And it, the Bible doesn't tell us what went wrong, but something went wrong. And we don't know if it's after 7 years, 10 years, 12 years. I don't know how long they were married, how old the kids got before this moment happened. But at some point, before you get to chapter 3, something went wrong and Gomer left him. And Gomer went and started living somewhere else. And he doesn't know where. And he doesn't go chasing her. He's hurt. At least I got the kids. At least I got this life. And she's gone. And God comes to him in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. God's trying to make a point. He's trying to build a parable with these two. This parable exists today so that we can learn from it. There's more. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say a little disclaimer. She has, she's cheated on him. He's about to go and forgive her and take her back. I am not trying to use this story to make a broad statement about people that have been cheated on and that they must Christian forgive their spouse no matter how abused they are. I'm not that pastor. Jesus did not set that standard that way. Jesus said, if your love has been shattered and your trust has been shattered, there's a very tender place that you need to go to. And you're not obligated to stay married in that place. I'll also say this. I know in the story <laughs> that it's the woman who's unfaithful. And maybe you're here today and you're like, golly, pastor, post me too movement. And you're going to give us the story where the, where the woman is the problem. Let me just tell you, this is a 3,000 year old ancient document. And it was not written to one specific culture in time. It was written to all cultures in times. That's number one. Number two, you need to know that if you read the Bible far enough, you're going to find what David did to Bathsheba. You're going to find what Judah did to Tamar. And I got story after story I can do to you, give to you of the blockhead men who walked this path, the destruction that came about. The Bible is an equal opportunity book. So she's gone off and we don't know why. And you start to wonder why. And God says, go, go and find her. And so he goes to find her. <laughs> and I, the scripture doesn't say, but I imagine he had to search. And what you're going to find out in a minute, and don't bring up this slide just yet, but what you're going to find out in a minute is that she got herself sold into sex slavery. She's being trafficked now. And you're like, what? what's going on here? We're not told. And you got to wonder, let your imagination fill in the blanks just a little bit because I think it might help you. It's like, why did she leave? I don't know. Is she, is she the first ancient example of a sex addict? Was damage done to her? Were patterns developed in her at a young age? 
Did she reach a certain point and she went back into old patterns, destructive patterns, like a lot of us here go back into old destructive patterns? Maybe she never meant to get into the sex trade. Maybe she was captured. I mean, I don't know what happened. Other possibilities. <laughs> what if she had learned that when other men were interested in her and she had that attention, it fulfilled her? And what if she got married to this guy and he's such a man of God and his head's buried in, in the books all the time, you know? And he's not paying any attention to her at all. And she starts to hunger. She's got this bottomless pit in her soul like a lot of us do. And she goes to fill it with things that are hard, bad. Maybe she never meant it to go like this. Maybe they were financially strapped. and Maybe she thought that she could go and make some money. Maybe she felt like that was a way that she could control her life. You can start to enter into a lot of these things and you can start to see the humanity that's there. And maybe Hosea, while he's going, he's searching for her and, and have you seen my wife? And he's the man of God there locally. What's this doing to his reputation? What kind of shame is on his family? And he's searching for her. Like God said, go search for her. He's got to buy her back. Verse 2 so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. So he doesn't just have to forgive and humble and humiliate himself. He has to buy her back. Some scholars even think that this picture that's being given as to us here is of her on some kind of an auction block. I don't know. But he can't just forgive her and say, come on, honey, let's go home. He has to buy her. Did he know that part of this whole picture was also related to him. <laughs> While he was searching for her, was God working on Hosea's heart and, and saying, you know, you did ignore her all those times. Have you realized the position that you put her in? Maybe you've got a hand in this, Hosea. We don't know. It's, it's not told to us. When he put the money down for her, was the money not just for her, was the money for us? in that situation. You're like, no, Jose was probably perfect, right? No. The only perfect husband, Jesus. The only one. We're talking about a broken, sinful man here, prophet or no prophet. So maybe he puts the money down and it's for us. Here's, here's the last verse. I just think it's so powerful. It says, then I told her, this is Hosea talking. You are to live with me many days, but you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. And I will behave the same way toward you. I think that's so powerful because some of us, again, if you're thinking that he's this perfect guy, and she did everything wrong, and the, the, the little messages and the speeches that we make to ourselves, why didn't he just walk up, put the money down, grab her hand, say, come on, we're going home. And don't do this to me again. He could have talked himself into that little speech, but he doesn't. Instead, it's like he stops and restates the vows. And he says, how about you be faithful to me? And by the way, I'll be faithful to you as well. He reciprocates to her. That's so powerful. He doesn't owe her that, but maybe he does. Here's the point. What's beautiful about this story is that God shows us this, this fundamental principle is that love always pays. Always pays. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how much is your responsibility and how much is their responsibility. Love always pays. I'm going to pay the cost to bring us back together again. Who else pays? Jesus, yes. Jesus paid the ransom for our souls. The scripture tells us not with silver and gold, but with his precious blood. He pays for us. The very nature of God level love is that it pays. It always pays. And I'm encouraging you today. It's like, how do we get, how do we get back in the spin zone? For real. How do we get the fire back? Part of the picture is you'll have to pay. 
let go of some things. Amen? Why don't you guys stand? Some of us have some conversations we need to have this afternoon. Don't let this time, don't let this moment leave. Let's pray. Jesus, you didn't speak such a beautiful picture of love to us so that we would be hopeless, God. You spoke it so that we would have hope and so that we would reach and we would try. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, we can see some of your sanity come back to our insanity. Jesus, would you save our marriages? Would you bring the fire back? It's been so long. Would you teach us how to keep the valleys shorter? Teach us how to love each other the right way. Deal with the foxes, God. We love you, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name.